Good evening, dear listeners. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third House of European History expert talk in the context of our temporary exhibition, Fake for Real. This exhibition shows how for centuries, human beings have deceived each other through falsifications, fakes, and forgeries. But the exhibition also displays the antidote, the critical mind in quest of truth and facts in the form of many examples in which fakes and forgeries were over the centuries uncovered and revealed. At the last expert talk, we heard a neuroscientist explain why our brains are so easy to deceive. Today, we'll turn to fact-checking, but not by our brains, but by artificial intelligence. How can technology help with fact-checking in the political arena? Our today's expert is asking, do politicians actually speak the truth? Or do they simply tell lies and apologize later, after the fact? With the latest tool and advancement in technology, FactRank can fact-check everything being said in real time. FactRank is a new online tool that automatically detects checkable claims made by politicians in parliamentary debates or tweets, thereby enabling fact-checkers to work much at a much faster speed than ever before. This uh, tool works by scanning a text and identifying the sentences which are factual and relevant. That is to say, they contain a fact which may or may not be true and which are relevant to a large group of people or are politically interesting, for example. Today, Jan Jagas discusses how this new tool can change the game of real-time fact-checking in the political arena and hold politicians more accountable than ever before. Jan Jagers is assistant professor in journalism at the Free University of Brussels and freelance journalist since 2008. He holds a PhD in political science of the University of Antwerp. As a lead fact checker for Knack magazine since 2012, he steered Knack to become the first signatory in Belgium of the International Fact Checking Network and to collaborate with Facebook through its third-party fact-checking program since 2020. Jan Jagas also led the Dutch-Flemish team of researchers, fact-checkers and machine learning experts that in, uh, during the recent years developed fact rank. After Jan Jagas' remarks, the audience is invited to ask questions through the YouTube chat, chat as usual. The discussion will be moderated by HEH lead educator Guido Gerichhausen. Mr. Jagas, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I really look forward to learning from you. And I hope that while I was talking, you checked whether what I said was actually true. Mr. Jagas, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I'll try, by, I'll try to share my screen to start uh, and see whether that works or not. So if we are good you should see a full screen with the title of my talk right now is so that can, indeed the case i can see it indeed here on zoom but i think i see it's also the case on on youtube because we have this, this small delay i'll just wait for your sign Hido. yeah of course yeah, so it seems that you also can see it on, on YouTube. So uh, thank you again. And uh, the floor is yours to, uh, for your very excellent for your, for your talk. OK, thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. According to the colors above, you might think that this talk addresses disinformation in Italy. Well, that is not the case. <laughs> uh, the only connection here is that next Friday, the Belgian Red Devils will play against the Azzurri in the European Championship football. And for many people, that is more important than what we will discuss here the coming hours. So let's get down to business. With this recent example, a picture of a bank in Utrecht in the Netherlands that went viral on Facebook in the Netherlands and Belgium a few weeks ago. Attention, this bench is only for vaccinated people, the sticker says. It has logos on it of the Dutch authorities, but they prove to have nothing to do with it. The picture is real. There's no Photoshop involved. The sticker was made by critics of government policies to boil up emotions against it. Now, the reason why I show you this 
is because it illustrates how COVID has been a game changer in terms of disinformation in Flanders, Belgium. Before, it seemed to be rather far from our bed, something we associated with Donald Trump and Brexit, but COVID changed the scene. You might have seen this piece of disinformation, saying that garling with warm water and salt eliminates the virus. It was spread thousands and thousands of times in different languages, English, Chinese, Indonesian, Arabic, Hindi, and Dutch. The context for this talk is the Low Countries, Belgium and the Netherlands. Now, for those who don't know, Belgium has three official languages, French, German, and Dutch. And the language of the Northern part of the country is the same as in the Netherlands. Although I have to admit, when I order a beer in central Amsterdam, I get answered in English and I'm not kidding you. So um, language is important. Although in this information knows no borders, every language infosphere is a separate universe as well. And especially when it comes down to tooling for text, that is important to keep in mind. I'll come back to that later on when we discuss fact writing. Now, quick as context, Flanders is the northern part of Belgium. It has 6 million inhabitants on a total of 11 million Belgians. And fact-checking in Flanders is rather young. We have right now three main fact-checking operations. The first one is Fact-Check Flanderen on the left, an independent fact-checking platform since 2018. The second one in the middle is VRT News, the public broadcaster. And then on the right-hand side, there is Knack Magazine, so far the only IFCN signatory in Belgium of all Belgian media brands. And the International Fact-Checking Network, that's an American-based nonprofit organization for fact-checkers all over the world, as you can see right here. So that is well-populated already. Now, the first question I want to address is a crucial one. What is this information? And the reason why it is important to start with this one is because definitions differ. And I want to point out a fact checker's view on the matter. One way to look at it is through this diagram. This information, it says, differs from misinformation and malinformation. Malinformation on the right is real information spread with an intent to harm, like the Clinton emails during the 2016 presidential election in the United States. Misinformation on the left is false information spread without the intent to harm. It's often even the opposite. Think about your uncle unknowingly sharing a factually false anti-vax post to warn his friends and families for health risks. This information, according to, to this diagram, sits in between. It's both false information and spread with the intent to harm. Now, following from the idea that we need accurate terms to describe reality, that's what academics do, they give us concepts to describe reality. Claire Wardle, a leading academic on the matter, says we should no longer use the term fake news. It's just a curse word, she argues, without meaning. Fake news is often not news, a meme, for example, and it is often not new, like old pictures used in a new false context. So instead, she uses the term information disorder and always makes a clear distinction between misinformation on the one hand and disinformation on the other. From an academic point of view, I totally agree. But as a fact checker, I use a practical definition. And the idea here is if it walks and talks like a duck, it is one. Of course, the motivation of the speaker, is there a malicious intent or not, is massively important to know who you are dealing with. But as a fact checker in practice, that is often hard or even impossible to find out. We cannot look into someone's head. So sharply put, we focus on first things first, the content and its impact. So although it is cursing in the academic church, we use this pragmatic approach. We consider disinformation or misinformation as factually incorrect or inaccurate information in the public sphere with or without the intent to cause harm. If you put these on a spectrum, it goes from humor and innocent satire on the left to malicious geopolitical operations on the right. So let's dive in and see some Belgian examples 
according to the categories used by Claire Wardle and first draft news here on your screen. The first and most innocent kind of bad information is satire. Here's an example of a satirical article that says, Belgium health minister puts ban on non-essential sexual activities of persons three or greater in indoor areas. Not true, of course, but a good story. Shared in disbelief, mainly by people outside of Belgium. This is another one. Doctors encourage COVID-19 vaccine injections in penis, it says, with a fake CNN logo on it. Is this a joke? Or for real, someone asks in the comments. When widely shared and conceived as a truth, this joke helps to rise vaccination skepticism. It, well, it, you could say it cuts deep. The second kind is false connection or clickbait content. This news article reports on an Italian study about a certain chemical that seems to affect penis sizes of men who live in this industrially polluted environment. The chemical is also used in cooking pans, but in the research, no cooking pans were, were involved whatsoever. So actually, there is no evidence to say that cooking pans make penises shrink. So first of all, don't worry. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is, ladies and gentlemen, is how a myth is born. Misleading content is the third kind of disinformation. Here you see a picture of a Belgian shopping street packed with people during the pandemic. And then be surprised that the number of infections rises again, says the byline on Facebook. In reality, however, the shopping street was not so packed as it seemed on the picture. The effect comes from the lens that was used to shoot the image, research shows. So this is misleading content. Fourth kind of disinformation, is false, con false context. A Flemish woman shares a real video on Facebook in November, 2020. The past weeks, 20,000 migrants arrived on the Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, she writes. While actually, the video was recorded on Ibiza in the Mediterranean. On the Canary Islands arrived migrants too, but 6,000, not 20,000. Imposter content, is content that misuses the credibility of real news sources and a fifth category of disinformation. Here you see a classical example of an article seemingly from the Belgian newspaper Le Soir during the French election campaign saying that Saudi Arabia favored Macron as the new president. The links on this page led to the real webpage of Le Soir, but the article was completely false and meant to influence the outcome of the election. Now, this earlier example that we've seen before is a case of imposter content too, because it misuses the logo of CNN. And this illustrates that in reality, we often see mixed forms of all those theoretical categories. The sixth one is manipulated or altered content. This picture, for instance, it's, it shows a press conference of the Belgian government, and it led to anger on social media. What we see, are ministers who do not apply the social distance rule, it was claimed. As always, the rules they make do not apply for themselves, was the anti-establishment narrative. But is this picture real? Not so, it turned out. The big one in the middle is the original picture from a news article from March 11th. On the original image, there is no logo of the social distance rule in the background. So the picture has been altered and manipulated. The picture was taken on March 10th, the social distance rule in Belgium was only introduced a week later on March 18th. The seventh and last type of disinformation is fabricated content, created from nothing, totally new, false content like this well known story. And this screenshot of a deep fake video, another example of fabricated content, is a Belgian case that attracted attention in April 2020. It shows Belgium's prime minister at the time, Sophie Wilmes, speaking of an urgent need to tackle economic and climate crisis. The video has been put into circulation by Extinction Rebellion Belgium, a self-called pressure group for system change. At the end of the video, they revealed themselves. The deepfake was not so much used to mislead, but as a campaign technique to draw attention for their cause with success because most Flemish newspapers reported it. 
So what's the conclusion? From an academic point of view, it totally makes sense to narrowly define disinformation as false content with malicious intent. From a fact checkers point of view, however, we need to widen the scope, take into account that even innocent jokes can pollute the public debate and should be fact checked in case they are likely to cause harm. So how do we spot alleged disinformation? To name methods of our practice, well, we try to minimize this, but there is coincidence, an article or a social media post we come across. Then secondly, there's the public, and of course, tools that help us to monitor public debate and make the right decisions. CrowdTangle, for instance, is a tool we use to oversee Facebook and, Fa and Instagram to monitor news and information about COVID-19. CrowdTangle created this dashboard. It helps us to see what goes around and what goes viral at a certain moment in time. Now, to understand what the role of technology is for fact-checking, we need to bear in mind what fact-checking is. It is a journalistic genre. Like an interview, a column, or a news report, it has its own rules and characteristics, of which the most important of all is transparency of sources. What you see here is the workflow of fact-checking. We monitor public debate, we spot and select claims, then check them and publish and spread the fact-check. In this process, technology plays a key role, not so much to replace humans, but to assist us. Fact Checkers of Full Fact, the UK charity against disinformation that is leading in tech development, distinguishes three main areas in which technology can help fact checkers. The first one is knowing the most important thing to be fact checking each day. The second one, knowing when someone repeats something we already know to be false. And thirdly, checking things in as close to real time as possible. It's in the first field, the monitoring claim spotting that fact rank place. Now, what is fact track? It is, as uh, it already said, it is a free tool that automatically identifies factual claims in Dutch track text transcriptions that are worthy of a fact check. This is how the website looked in 2020, September 2020. Especially take note of the fourth bullet point underneath the small cross. Fact rank is not an automatic fact check. Whether a claim is true or false, fact rank does not tell you right now. That's important uh, to realize. It is a monitoring tool that helps us oversee public debate that ensures that we did not miss any important claims and saves us time. So now let me briefly tell you the story of this tool. Inspiration for it comes from Claimbus, a tool from the University of Texas that I, that I came across in 2016 or early 2017. Don't fact check me in that. You could drop English text in the field on screen of Claimbuster, for instance, from an interview with a politician, let the tool run over it, and it ranks sentences to their checkworthiness. What comes up are factual claims that might be worthy of a fact check. Thus, the tool saves time because Instead of reading the interview manually, the scanning work is done by computer. I was flabbergasted and I thought, wow, if only this would exist for Dutch too, it would save me so much time. So in late 2017, I was invited to give a lecture about my work as a fact checker for Knack by Bettina Berend, professor in computer science at Catholic University of Leuven in a seminar for her students. I brought up the idea in the seminar and three students accepted the challenge. They delivered the prototype several months later in mid 2018, and their work struck me. Rest, you could say, is history. What followed in 2019, 2020, was a project funded by the Flemish Journalism Fund, an innovation fund. We further developed, refined, and optimized the tool with a team of fact checkers, scientists, and foremost, machine learning engineer and deep learning expert, Raphael Houtekiet. That's the man in the middle, the man in the middle with the banana. Um, it was a cross-border collaboration between the Netherlands on the one hand, Flanders on the other. We share the same language, so the two, especially the technology behind it, could equally be useful uh, for both of us. Part of the team were Alexander Pleiter and Peter Burger from Nice Checkers at Leiden University on the left, Bettina Berend from KU Leuven on the right, and Peter van Aalst, political and communication scientists from the University 
of Antwerp. This is how fact rank looks today. And these are the sources that it permanently scans for claims to fact check. There's Twitter, Twitter feeds of all Belgian and Dutch members of parliament. Secondly, there's transcripts of parliamentary debates in Belgium and the Netherlands. And there's subtitles of news and debate programs on Flemish television. If we take a look at what it said last Friday, we see a set of claims. Left above, for instance, it says, one in five people who gamble have a risk to get addicted. That's a claim from a journalist in Villa Politica, a TV show on Flemish television. Reassuring or not that figure, this is a factual and relevant claim. Or take bottom right. In our country, five multinationals are responsible for almost as much emissions as all households together. A claim by a politician of the extreme left. Interesting, relevant claim. But there are other examples too, less pertinent or even bad outcomes in the sense that it is not what we are looking for. Take this one in yellow below. If you click on the icon encircled in green, that's an important feature of FactRank, it takes you immediately to the original source of the claim, the time and place where the statement was done in the public sphere. That could be a full transcription of a, of a parliamentary debate, the temple icon in the same column but higher up, or as in this case, a news program on television. Now, why is this feature so useful? Because again, it saves us time. To assess whether a claim should be prioritized or not, we need to know the exact content in which the statement was done. And that is immediately fulfilled with one click here. So if we click on it, FactRank leads us to the news program and to the exact spot where the statement was done. As I said, this is a false positive, not what we are looking for. As soon as I'm on stage, the statement of this ballet dancer goes, that's just, you feel it. It's really an adrenaline rush that goes through your body. Is this factual? Yes, it's a factual claim. But what's the relevance for it? The relevance of, of it for public debate? Zero. It's just an individual expression of an individual emotion. No more, no less. What happened here? Well, let me take you to the kitchen where fact rank was made. Fact rank scans sentences for two parameters. Firstly, is it factual or not? Secondly, is it relevant for public debate or not? First off, we created a code book using and defining our four coding categories. Not factual is the first one. Brexit is no good idea, for instance. That's an opinion, not a checkable fact. Second category, and this is what we are looking for, factual and relevant. For instance, we, meaning the Belgians, are the fastest vaccinators in the world. That's what the Belgian health minister said last week. The third coding category is for factual and non-relevant claims. I am standing here before you, for instance. Factual, but not interesting to fact check. Error is a rest category. Now, um, we used this codebook, um, then afterwards labeled more than 8,000 sentences by human annotators and used those uh, sentences and data set to create a deep learning model and adjust it um, to proceed. Now, what we found out by testing is that the human interrated agreement did almost not exceed 70%. Now, what does this mean? To which extent do human fact checkers agree with the code book and the rules at hand on how to classify a sentence? Is it factual irrelevant or not? Well, in only seven out of 10 cases, human fact checkers agree on that decision. Of course, the point here is, if even humans don't agree, it is quite logical that fact rank from time to time comes up with false positives. Take this example. Kevin De Bruyne earns 300,000 euros per year. Kevin De Bruyne, that's one of our Belgian star players who hopefully will play and score against the Italians on Friday. We had an epic discussion about this claim. Is it factual? For sure. But relevant for a fact check? That's another question. Not only is it hard to check, personally, I don't have access for, to, to his banking account, but besides, how much do we care? The public does not genuinely care whether it is 300,000 or 400,000, I argued. So not relevant. I would not select it to fact check. 
but for sure. On the other hand, it's, it's a lot of money and the exorbitant wages of football players are a relevant issue, my colleague argued. So there is no black and white here. What is relevant and what is not depends not only on the claim itself, but also on what's in the news cycle, what is hot in public debate at a certain time. Now back from the kitchen to how you can use the tool, there's another feature. Like what Claim Buster allows you to do with English text, you can copy paste any Dutch text in this frame and let Factrank do the scanning for you. With an example, last Saturday, the newspaper De Morgen published an interview with Christia, Christina Pagel, a mathematician who is a member of the British expert group that informs the public about the pandemic. In Belgium, the number of COVID infections will rise too, says the headline. The content of newspapers is not automatically fed into fact rank. So as fact checkers, we need to read pages and pages and pages and scan them for potential falsehoods or interesting newsworthy claims for a fact check. That takes time. If we copy paste the text of this interview in fact rank, this is what happens. As a result, in this case, several factual claims light up. The first one says, one with the three flames, also in less severe cases, COVID causes significant loss of brain capacity in the areas responsible for memory and concentration. This might be an interesting claim to fact check, not because it looks suspicious or damaging, but because it raises interesting questions. What does Pagel mean by less severe cases? Does she mean every case? And what does she mean by significant loss? What's the consequence in terms of daily life? How much memory are we talking about? For how long? This feature of fact rank, in short, speeds up reading and scanning newspapers from claims to fact check. Now I'll leave it here, now I'll leave it here for fact rank right now. If we look ahead and see the bigger picture of countering disinformation in Europe, it is important to share that at the end of May, one month ago, the European Commission announced that it will fund eight new regional hubs of EDMO, European Digital Media Observatory Network, to strengthen Europe. Two of those regional hubs will cover Belgian soil. The EDMO Belux, covering Luxembourg and the French-speaking part of Belgium, and the EDMO Bene, covering the Netherlands and Flanders, the Dutch speaking region. Now, Connect and VRT News are part of the last one on the Flemish side. And one of our goals is to further develop Factor. We are pleased to be part of this project and looking forward to collaborate with our Dutch partners starting after the summer break. Now, to finish off, I want to share this easy and simple line with you. As for me, it summarizes the problem with this information and the solution for it from a fact checker's point of view. Facts matter, emotions rule. As fact checkers, we believe that accurate facts matter and we try to get them into the center of democratic debate. But in doing so, we have to be humble. Always aware that facts are only facts and that deep down in the core, what people believe to be true or not is dictated more by emotions than by clean figures. If we want to have impact, we have to be aware of that. In practice, it means writing firm, but with empathy, aiming for inclusion and depolarizing rather than the opposite. Thank you so much. I give the floor back and look forward to your thoughts, comments, and questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan, for, for this inspiring uh, talk and also for showing how the technology of, of fact bank might help. Uh, to, to fact check and also dip, yeah, to, to fact check different statements uh, made by different people, maybe politicians. Um, also, as you pointed out in, in, in your talk, fact checking has always been uh, a central task of journalism. Uh, but given the ever growing amount uh, and speed of news, both online and, and offline, uh, as well as the growing amounts of, of misinformation and, and disinformation, um, it's becoming increasingly important uh, to support human fact checkers with, with let's say, semi-automated uh, methods or this monitoring tool that you showed us uh, to make their work more efficient. And I hope that, that FactRank is one of the tools that, that help us to, to achieve this. 
Uh, but I was wondering in, in your talk that um, the technology might be one element that, that helps us to, to improve fact checking or maybe helps us to that it becomes easier or that we can do it quicker. Uh, but also I was wondering in your talk, also the, the examples that, that you uh, showed us, uh, that they seem somehow that it's more kind of looking at a kind of claim fact checking. So we are looking for claims. And I was wondering, is this the right approach? So it should be also maybe as a non-expert, I was wondering, should we maybe looking at more kind of an issue centric approach uh, so that we look at different kind of topics or issues that are maybe relevant. I think also one of the points that you addressed was relevant. Uh, and if we focus kind of this kind of way, um, how would you look at this as an, uh, as, a, as an expert that we maybe now look more kind of really at, at false claims instead kind of an overarching strategy or more kind of um, uh, an issue-centric uh, uh, approach? I, I think we should combine both. So um, you should combine the um, claim-centered approach with the issue, uh, with the issue. So I think in um, over time, you can build databases of fact checks or often common myths that keep on coming, coming, coming back, put them into a database and um, put, let's say uh, tag all those fact checks so that these databases are organized around these issues you are mentioning. For instance, climate change, migration, that are two, let's say, hot issues the coming, coming years, I, I suppose. Uh, when it comes down to disinformation. Now, important to point out, I guess, is also that, let's say the last 10 years, fact-checking has fundamentally changed in the sense that when we are talking 2008, 2010, it was mainly claim-checking that we did, and we still do. Um, but with the, um, with the su success of social media uh, and also the downside of it, I think much of our resources today go rather to debunking, debunking claims of uh, like false context, uh, disinformation of old photos that are reused in a new context. These are strictly spoken. It's another thing than a, it's another thing than a politician who makes a factual, an allegedly factual claim. Um, and it's in a way it is although the principles are the same. It also requires a different set of skill sets. Okay, thank you uh, for, for taking that uh, that question. Uh, I also still encourage the, the viewers to also um, ask their questions in, in the chat on, uh, on on our YouTube uh, page, uh, because in the next twenty minutes in this Q and A segment, I will uh, take as many questions as possible uh, together with, with with Jan, of course. Uh, beforehand, we already got some uh, some questions, and I think they are more clustered around, let's say, uh, a three predominantly three three topics. Um, so one is more like of the process uh, and and decision making. I think also you addressed a little bit uh, why you actually fact check some uh, some topics or some uh, fact, uh, some some maybe uh, pages or some some information. Uh, and secondly, it's more around feedback and, and reaction that you get. Uh, and the last point is more obviously about also the technology and, and uh, how this can become uh, uh, bigger or what kind of role this can, this can play. Um, if we maybe, I was also wondering about this process and, and this decision making. Uh, and the, the one question that we got there is, um, of, of course you do this with an entire group, and yet, for I think it was this example with uh, with the Bruyne about how much money he, he makes. Um, so, how does this debate looks like in your team, and also maybe this cross border team? And what what is it that makes you then really uh, fact checking one kind of article or one statement, and not going for for another statement? Because obviously, then you spend time on fact checking one, and then you don't have time to do to do something else for it. Yeah. Um I think there are, let's say, some general principles we try to, to live up to. And the first one, of course, is the amount of damage that could potentially be done by a certain claim or, or disinformation post. I mean, if, if we're talking, for instance, um, about uh, drinking cleaning products 
uh, to cure COVID-19 that is affecting lives, that is affecting people's lives. So no doubt at all that that will be right on top of mind uh, to fact check such a claim. Um, so I think that the potential damage being done, um, especially on people's health and on lives, uh, that is, let's say, the, the, the most important uh, criterion uh, we use uh, to select claims for a fact check or not. Now, secondly, of course, there are other indicators we use as well. Um, for instance, virality, the, the amount of people that encountered a claim uh, plays a role. And of course, this cuts in two sides because you could say, well, um, if many people saw the claim and it seems to be disinformation, a false claim, um, it is a reason to fact check it because you want to get the truth out there especially for those people who already saw it. Now, on the other hand, virality and the amount of people that saw or claim um, cuts otherwise, because you could also argue the sooner you debunk a claim, um, the less chance a claim gets to go viral. So that's, let's say, a, a double cutting sword. Um, which other indicators do we use to select claims for a fact check? Well, for instance, we try to be balanced. Uh, we are committed to use all, uh, all political sites, all, uh, spect the whole spectrum. So that's something to take into account as well. If we, um, if we check, let's say the last uh, month, like 10 out of 20 claims came from leftist politician, that could be an, argue an argument to more check to the right whether there is something to check as well because it's of course it's very important um, for us to be perceived by the public as objective and, and neutral uh, professional fact checkers uh, so that's why this balance is also an argument and then for the same uh, reasons you could say that also a kind of balance between issues you mentioned before uh, could also be an argument so not of course these Last months, we have been focusing on COVID and on vaccine misinformation uh, as a priority. Uh, nevertheless, we, from time to time, we take other claims as well, just to, um, to, to be assured that we are not really too narrowly and too confining, uh, too confining our work. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for taking uh, that question. Uh, I might come back to this balance between left and, and right politicians or statements uh, later on. Uh, because in the meanwhile, we have one uh, question from, uh, from a viewer. Uh, and as you know, we uh, are here in a, in a multilingual uh, environment. Um, and also some so a viewer, Katarina, is, is wondering uh, whether the tool or there are other tools available in, in this case in German because you explained it's in Dutch now, but is there, yeah, do you have maybe the ID or, or the other tools that, that you could also use this, this tool to fact check in German or maybe other language? Well, as, as, as far as I know, and this is an important caveat, these tools do not exist in German. Um, what I am aware of is of course, uh, the English uh, spoken tools, the claim buster. There's also claim rank, which does the same kind of thing for Arabic. And then there's Chequiado, Checkerbots from the Argentine, from the Argentinian fact checkers from uh, Chequiado who uh, do this kind of stuff for Spanish and in a much more advanced way, I should say, because we, we are, um, I put it forward during my talk, since we are a small country and a small language area, uh, we also have, let's say, less resources and, and, and we're, um, from that perspective, a bit behind the big guys from France, from France, uh, and of course, the Anglo-Saxon uh, the, the Anglo area. And that is um, a disadvantage and an advantage at the same time. So the disadvantage is that we are behind. We like resources and we are behind. Now, the advantage of that one is of course that you can be inspired by what others have done before you and try to, let's say, kind of copy and tweak it for your own uh, environment. So it's, it's also a very um, balanced and double puzzle here. 
Now, um, concerning the German, um, of course, I would I would invite everybody to to try and check it. For instance, in the in the screen where you can put in your text. Um, back in the time when fact rank did not exist yet, uh, I did use Claim Buster with Dutch text, and even there, from time to time, it it magically it it seemed to work. So it is not unthinkable that while it will not be perfect at all, it could be of any use for Dutch fact checkers as well. And of course, then I'm only speaking about this screen where you can copy paste the text because the the, the sources that are fed are no German uh, sources, of course. Um, that being said, um, I'm always open for, for interaction and collaboration with, with German fact checks or, or German uh, technology builders as well. Maybe they can profit from from the from our code book, from from the way we have been trying to uh, to, to to issue this problem. Um, and if if anyone uh, if anyone wants to reach out, please feel free to do so. Thank you, uh, Jan. Um, the, the next one, we have another question uh, uh, from uh, uh, on YouTube. Uh, it's more kind of the feedback that you get after you maybe checked a, a claim. Uh, and I think it can, you could go both ways, both positive, but also negative, like a positive, maybe um, does a, a politician reach out to you afterwards when you maybe, um, that you said that he made a false claim uh, or a statement and that he actually comes back or thank you or actually the other opposite or also in line with this. Um, if, for instance, a politician makes a, a false statement, are there any repercussions uh, for, for this person or how does this, uh, this process then later uh, or after that you said this is a false claim, how does the process then later uh, looks like? Well, that depends. Um, maybe first off, um, if, I want, uh, if, I wa if I wanted compliments, I should have really looked for another job because this is not the business where you get that money compliments and especially not from the people um, that um, made the claims that you fact check and, and say that they're, well, let's say incorrect. So um, there's honestly speaking, not so much positive feedback. And in my view, and of course I'm biased here, um, in my view, that is not because people do not appreciate what we do. But I think it's just, and, and there's an argument for that. They're just thinking, well, you're doing your job. And that is what we try to do every day. Um, so uh, from that point of view, um, no complaints uh, about that one. Now, your question about the repercussions of a false claim made by a politician, maybe I can answer that one with, with, an ex with a quite recent example. There was um, a politician, Philippe de Winter, who posted, um, who shared a video of a man who was kicking a Jew in the street. Um, and his byline uh, with that video was, this is Germany 2021. So we, we, we looked into it and it seemed to be um, an old video, um, a Russian video from 2017. Uh, we, tra we tracked it down to 2017. So we confronted, uh, we confronted him uh, with that fact uh, before we published. And his reaction was, well, if, um, if I'm mistaken, um, and if it's an independent third party uh, that can convince me of my mistake, um, I will just, um, I will react uh, in the appropriate way. And so we, integrated that citation, that reaction of the politician in our piece, um, waiting for his reaction. And what he did was he retracted the tweet that contained the video, but he did not rectify it. So that is, of course, let's say, um, it's like coming halfway because all the people who saw it in passing their timelines um, if you would be a journalist or would be if uh, any, uh, let's say, let's say um, get a heart for truth, um, then you would rectify yourself and say, well, just I, I made a mistake here. I was too quick. 
Uh, sorry about that. This video does not come from Germany 2021, but it seems to be a Russian video of 2017. Thank you. And also, I, I was uh, wondering also on this note that you also said that the being balanced, uh, which you said before, and that you look for different kind of uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, but how do you stay objective? And also, how does the audience perceive you uh, uh, in being uh, objective? Is it really just like then now and then, then looking at left politicians and then at right uh, politicians? Or maybe also on another note, how do you maybe uh, involve the audience or the readers? Uh, do you also ask them what they, for instance, would like to see uh, fact check? Um, that's a very important uh, source of, and let's say, an, an, um, a feeding line we use to select our claims that we want to check. So I showed you the email address um, where people can send in claims, of course, with, uh, with a source. And, and if it's a YouTube video, for instance, please tell us at what time, uh, at what spot in the video, the claim was made so we, we can we can look into it um, and see whether other people are, are coming up with the same ideas and the same doubts about uh, certain information online um, so that is an, an important tip line uh, you could say now in countries like for instance um, i think in france but for sure uh, in in spain as well and and i guess in germany as well um, these these types of uh, incoming notes are, as far as I know, more developed than it is right now um, in Belgium and Flanders. So we are, as I said, fact-checking is in Flanders, it, it's pretty young, not in the sense that we are not already doing it long, but it's, it is rather young in the, in the sense of the development and the resources that we can spend on it. And so, um, we especially try to engage the public as much as possible. And I think it is not only important um, as a resource for claims, but maybe equally or more important is that they share our fact checks. Because what research says, and that's an, an MIT study of 2018, shows that disinformation travels six times faster than real news and people tend to share this information 70% more than real information. So you've got this quantitative disbalance between shared facts and shared disinformation. So what we need and what, to, what we need to build day by day is this kind of community, community, let's say, friends of the fact checkers who want to share our fact checks and who want to share facts so that this quantitative balance between the disinformation and the truthful information gets a bit more into balance and if possible, even to the, to the right way, so to speak. Thank you. Maybe we, we take, a talk, uh, take a last question uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, the last one is from, uh, from Simina Barica. She wonders uh, how the future of, of, of fact-checking, uh, in your opinion, uh, will look like. That's a good and a difficult question because I'm a fact-checker and, and future um, claims about the future, uh, especially are not to be fact-checked. But anyways, what I think is and and of course i'm i'm looking beyond my own borders here again is that the support that we will get from technology will will explode the coming three to five years so what you see now for instance is that more and more fact checkers are working together to build big databases with those fact checks so that as I mentioned in the, during the talk, the more and more we will be able to fact check in real time stuff. If a claim comes up that already has been fact checked, there will be technology with AI that can match the fact check that was made with this false claim and automatically get that message out. Now, what already exists, for instance, in it is, I saw it in um, a BBC, a BBC uh, report 
uh, on television of, if I'm not mistaken, 2016, um, was full fact again, the British fact checkers of full fact. They made a tool um, in collaboration with the National Bureau of Statistics. Um, it's, an, it's an app, I guess, in fact, where you can talk to your phone um, and Mivan Babakar, um, the, um, the deputy CEO of, of uh, the, the charity um, in UK, says to her, she says literally to her phone, GDP is rising. And then by the using of speech to text technology and combining um, these um, technology with the recent figures, the real figures of the National Bureau of Statistics, you immediately get this graph on your smartphone. So that is an example, I guess, of how the future could look like if, it, if it's about these quite simple, straightforward claims that have no need in for, for complex interpretation. Um, I think the technology could assist us to speed things up. Um, so that's, that's very inspiring and promising. Now, on the other hand, it is also a perfect example of the manner in which technology in English speaking countries um, is ahead if you compare it, especially to Dutch, which is a small language, like other small languages. Um, there is this uh, AI technology of, uh, of Elon Musk who can write perfectly English texts. Well, um, in Dutch, there are, let's say, some prototypes who try and do the same. They're not at the same level uh, of quality yet. So um, here again, in this multilingual world, there, is, uh, there are some differences. So thank you. So it seems like still humans and technology working together, but also on different speeds, also depending how big the language maybe maybe is, uh, and also the database then actually to 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 fact check uh, uh, something. Um, so thank thank you again, Jan, for uh, for this interesting talk and also for for answering uh, the questions from from the audience. Uh, if you at home still want to know more about specific to uh, Jan addressed in his talk, then you can go to, to the website uh, factrank.org. Uh, and in relation to this temporary exhibition, uh, Fake for Real, we have organized uh, this online uh, expert talk, uh, the flambo series The Flamboyant uh, Fake, which this talk was, was part of. Um, in this uh, series, different uh, experts from various fields uh, of science will provide a short insight uh, into their field of expertise. Uh, now we have a, have a holiday break during the summer, but afterwards we, we continue uh, with this series. Uh, and on October 28, we have invited uh, Professor uh, Jupp Leersen, uh, who will talk about uh, patriotic fakes. So something completely different, uh, but still related to the, to the temporary exhibition, uh, Fake for Real. Um, if you don't want to miss any of our talks, please subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel by uh, clicking subscribe uh, below. And of course, uh, if you are living close to Brussels and you do have the opportunity to visit our museum uh, or the Fake for Real uh, temporary exhibition, then you are more than welcome. Uh, even during COVID times, we are open from, uh, from Friday uh, to Sunday. Uh, so for now, thanks again very much, uh, Jan, for being with us today. Uh, and of course, also thank you at home for, for participating uh, in, in today's talk uh, and hope to see you next time uh, again. Uh, so have a good evening or a good day, depending uh, on where you are.